five. Okay, so first of all, we have, oh, you can go back to the welcome. I just wanna go over that real quick. So, I mean, if we keep the number small, that's fine. But as the number grows, um, definitely keep your web camera off and unless you're presenting or speaking. And of course, I have mine on just so you know that I'm here. And um, please mute your microphone if you're not speaking, just to minimize that, um, that sound disturbance we could have. And then raise your hand if you have a question or put a chat, like a message in the chat to everyone or one of us, um, either Kirk, Charnette, or myself. Um, I think that that would work and we'll just call on you if we have questions about what you're asking or we can read it aloud and um, whatever makes everybody comfortable there. But this is gonna be pretty low key, I think, with this lower number, but we're already at 35. So I'm gonna go ahead and get going. So thank you all for joining us today for the Everyday Accounts Round 7 Texas Caucus. Um, this is something that we've only done once before um, in this way a couple of years ago. And it was the first opportunity we had to do that. And this time we tried to invite a lot more representatives from throughout the state, but the timing seems to have been um, difficult because there are a lot of other things going on throughout the state and the nation today, a lot of conflicts. So I don't know how that's impacting our audience, but if you're here, thank you for being here. And if you know somebody that was planning to come, just let them know that we will have a link and everything. They can watch this back later. And the survey that we're going to be sharing will be available um, for a couple of weeks. So um, hopefully you'll still be able to benefit from today's caucus. And we'll definitely be sharing these notes later. So our main goal for today is to share with you the seven innovations from this round of Federal Highway Administration's Everyday Counts program and to find out which of these innovations are most important to you and your organizations. Um, several um, here are either on the stick or from TxDOT from what I'm seeing so far. So um, just, just take it home and, and see what you can come back with and share that either you are already doing or something you'd like to uh, learn more about. So for more than 10 years now, the FHWA ADC program has rapidly deployed proven technologies and processes. The seventh round for 2023 and 2024 focuses on safety for all road users building a sustainable infrastructure for the future and growing an inclusive workforce. And these have all been themes that have been prevalent in our state for the last few years um, throughout the pandemic and since. And some things that we would like for you to think about while we go over these innovations are which ones are already being deployed that you're aware of, whether it's just that you know about it, or you know maybe there's something that you've been doing in this area, which ones would you like to see deployed? Is it something that you would like to start doing in your organization? And then why would some of these be important topics for you and your organization? Why is this important? And you know, when you go back to focuses on safety for all road users, I think for me, that's been the big highlight of this year, the thing that jumps to the top in my mind every time. And so let me quickly go over this agenda, um, our goal, I've already gone over, but we're basically going to talk about um, these innovations and Kirk is going to go through each one and we will provide or have already provided fact sheets if you can see that in your invitation. And then these are active links on the agenda. If there is something you just really don't understand and you want to just jump on that um, and any questions you have, again, type those in the chat. Then after we go through each innovation, we're going to do a survey where it's more like a poll the audience. So, and we'll talk about a longer survey that we'll be sending out, but the poll the audience is just so we can all get a feel of what's at the top of our minds right now, what's glaring and what seems to be most important. And you will be able to rank all of the innovations in your ranking. And the top three, you know, are obviously what we'll talk about the most and focus on throughout this year. And definitely as we we implement these and look at where we are in implementation. And so with that, um, we will be doing some discussion and closing remarks. So that'll be an, an opportunity for people um, in this group, anyone to speak up and talk about what's important to you. And um, if you have questions or if you just wanna say what your organization is already doing, that would be a great opportunity to do that. And with that, Kirk, if you're ready, um, we can get started. Thank you, Shelley. Uh, my name is Kirk Fogger. I do, I'm working in the 
Texas Division Federal Highway in Austin. I'm a planning and research engineer. You've probably met me before through a number of the stick meetings or through previous everyday counts rounds. Uh, we've been working, as Shelly mentioned, on everyday counts since 2010, 2011. So it's been uh, quite a, a journey with us promoting innovation and making a, uh, creating a culture of innovation within our organization and others. Uh, next slide. Uh, one thing about innovation is that we're trying to accelerate it, uh, put it out in the field quicker, saving resources, saving time and money. And that's one of the reasons why we're uh, pursuing everyday counts and going all the way to everyday counts round seven for 22 and 23. Next, next slide. So why do we innovate? I mean, one of the things I look at in terms of innovation is uh, time savings, uh, saving on our resources, uh, pursuing uh, new innovations that will save lives. And uh, there's a number of different reasons why we innovate. And uh, we, we are in a time of, of a lot of innovation and paradigm shifts, moving towards electric cars, moving towards aut autonomous vehicles and and other types of technologies that are gonna transform the way Americans move and travel. Next slide. So USDOT has put together innovation principles. They serve as our policy priorities and we're helping America win the, the uh, economic battles of the 21st century by supporting workers. We're allowing for experimentation and learning from our failures. We're providing opportunities to collaborate and be flexible and adapt as technology, of course, changes over time. These are the uh, portfolio of innovation programs that Federal Highways has, going from accelerating market readiness for new technologies to our STIC. Um, as you know, we have 52 sticks in the country right now, and they're all working towards um, innovations like everyday counts and pursuing those as part of their program. Um, funding wise, we have the accelerated innovation deployment funds. We demonstrate those through uh, million dollar grants and through stick incentives at $100,000 uh, per cycle to, to pursue everyday counts type of activities. Next slide. So we have all these gears working together as one, uh, coordinating our, through our partners, through our funding mix. Uh, through our proven ideas that all the everyday counts innovations have been proven in other states, and we're just sharing them to see if we could spread and uh, make them more useful in other parts of the country. And letting people know about these innovations is one of the things we do to market and uh, reach out with our everyday counts program. Next slide. So everyday counts is a state-based model. It looks at proven and underutilized innovations uh, that make our transportation system work better, safer, and more efficient um, and equitable for all. Next slide. So how does everyday counts work? It's a two-year cycle for each everyday counts round. So we're in seven rounds. So it's been um, over 14 years, I guess. And then uh, we look at selecting identification of innovations through our interagency um, conversations with industry and with AASHTO and, and state DOTs. And we develop multidisciplinary deployment teams for each of the innovations to help provide technical assistance through workshops, peer exchanges, training, webinars, and demonstrations. Um, and also to create the fact sheets that you have uh, been sent and to create guidance and specifications. Next slide. So these are the stakeholder engagement. I mentioned a few of them, AASHTO, American Public Works Association, uh, AMPO, Association of Metropolitan Planning Organizations, NLTAPA, the LTAP uh, National Agency, NARC, um, NACE, ITE, ARPA, and of course, American uh, General contractors, ASC, American Society of Civil Engineers. So all these people work together to a framework to enter into the discussions of which EDCs 
go forward in each round. And this is uh, the ones that I'll mention today are seven that these agencies have thought that we should pursue at a national level. Next slide. So these are the rounds going back to 2011, 2012, and 23, 24 for round seven um, innovations. So we've had we've had a number of uh, innovations. I don't know, maybe over 50 or 60 so far. And luckily, some of the states have adopted 40 of these innovations and have looked into uh, institutionalizing them in their practices. Next slide. So these are the seven innovations for Everyday Counts Round 7, uh, beginning with nighttime visibility for safety, next generation TIM, um, integrating greenhouse gas and transportation planning, enhancing performance with internally cured concrete, environmental project descriptions for sustainable project delivery, rethinking DBE goals for design build, and strategic workforce development. I'll go through each of these innovations a little bit. And uh, if we have time, if you have questions, we can go through them in a little bit more detail based on the information that we have on hand. Uh, next slide. So this is a, a short video. It's Everyday Counts Round 7, Innovation for a Nation on the Move. And Federal Highway Headquarters Office of Accelerating Innovation, uh, Center for Accelerating Innovation has put together this video. And it's only three minutes long, as I understand it. So, Shane, could you go ahead and play it? Give us a little description of round seven. U.S. Department of Transportation logo, Federal Highway Administration. Every day, you have an opportunity to use innovations to transform the transportation system. The Federal Highway Administration's Everyday Counts program, known as EDC, is a state-based program that rapidly deploys proven but underutilized technologies and processes. EDC Round 7 highlights innovations to improve safety for all users, build a sustainable infrastructure for the future, and grow an inclusive workforce. The nighttime crash fatality rate is three times the daytime rate. Enhancing visibility along corridors, intersections, and pedestrian crossings can help reduce fatalities. This initiative promotes traffic control devices and properly designed lighting to improve safety for all users. Over 6 million crashes a year in the U.S. put responders and other vulnerable road users at risk. Next generation traffic incident management programs promote emerging technologies such as emergency vehicle lighting, tethered unmanned aerial systems, and cue warning solutions. These and other tools can advance safety and operations to mitigate incident impacts. Transportation is the largest emitter of greenhouse gases in the U.S. This initiative provides resources to help agencies quantify greenhouse gases and set goals to decrease motor vehicle, construction, and life cycle emissions during planning and project development. Shrinkage cracking in concrete is a limiting factor in achieving long-term concrete performance. Internal curing mitigates shrinkage cracking. It has the potential to triple the service life of concrete bridge decks and extend the performance of pavements and repairs. Highway pavement construction materials, such as asphalt and concrete, have environmental impacts during their life cycle. Environmental Product Declarations, or EPDs, document those impacts. This tool helps states support procurement decisions and quantify embodied carbon reductions using life cycle assessments for sustainable pavements. Many design-build contracts do not adequately address opportunities for disadvantaged businesses. New practices are available to support the effective integration of program requirements to help small disadvantaged businesses compete for design-build contracts. The demand for highway workers is growing and emerging technologies require new skills. This innovation helps stakeholders improve their ability to identify, train, and place highway construction workers. The focus will expand to rural and tribal communities to increase career opportunities. Together, we can enhance safety for all users, incorporate equity in project planning and delivery, and support a sustainable and resilient infrastructure.
Learn more at www.fhwa.dot.gov. Follow the Federal Highway Administration on Facebook, Instagram, Flickr, LinkedIn, Twitter, and YouTube. The U.S. government does not endorse products or manufacturers. Trademarks or manufacturers' names appear in this video because they are considered essential to the objective of the video. They are included for informational purposes only and are not intended to reflect a preference, approval, or endorsement of any one product or entity. Except for any statutes and regulations cited, the contents of this video do not have the force and effect of law and are not meant to bind the public in any way. This video is intended only to provide information to the public regarding existing requirements under the law. Okay, Shane, okay. appreciate that. That guy talks so fast, I couldn't understand what he was saying anyway. So there's there's a cap to, caption right there that tells all the words, but uh, he was a fast talker, wasn't he? Um, next yes. next slide. Uh, round seven, that's the- uh, Highway administration. Uh, let's, let's take the video off and go into the next- uh, Kirk, it sounds like you have some support there. <laughs> yeah, my dog's starting to wake up. If you hear him snoring, that's not me. That's my dog in the background. I'm trying to kick him out eventually. But uh, <laughs> uh, nighttime visibility for safety, it's like improving uh, visibility along corridors and intersections and pedestrians crossings that can help reduce nighttime crashes and fatality, fatalities. Um, the fa fatality rate on the nation, excuse me, let, me, let my dog out. I can say um, for this one, nighttime visibility for safety, um, it's definitely one that hits home around here. Kirk, you back? <laughs> yeah, I'm back. I'm sorry. I had to let my dog out. He's a great parent. He's, you know, he likes to bark. But um, sure. we're looking at um, on a nighttime uh, rate is three times higher than the daytime rate. And 76% of the pedestrian fatalities occur at night. So it's a very important um, safety uh, component to our planning and our project development process to look at projects that would include uh, include the addressing visibility problems with visible solutions at intersections at next slide shane okay it, that would save lives reduce nighttime crashes and reduce energy costs with led lighting which is uh, more cost effective and energy efficient but we're looking at safety benefits in terms of intersections because uh, nighttime crashes at rural and urban intersections can be reduced by 33 to 38% using that LED well-designed lighting. Uh, pedestrians and bicyclists, uh, we're looking at putting in rectangular rapid flashing beacons, 47% reduction in accidents, and advanced markings and signs with a 25% reduction, which makes it safer for people to cross the road at all all users, um, old, disabled, um, bicyclists, pedestrians, everyone uh, crossing that intersection. And roadway departures, we're looking at uh, flattening out horizontal curve curves and looking at curve delineation enhancements using chevrons, um, in-lane parking, pavement markings, there are fluorescent sheeting that can alert drivers to upcoming curves ahead. And uh, that's the state of the practice. Looking at across the country, we're already, we're already finding that peak communities and states are benefiting from the use of many of these countermeasures. And the fact sheet gets into some descriptions of other states and communities that have uh, been benefited from this type of uh, innovation. So if you have any questions, please raise, raise your hand or open up the chat uh, box and uh, put in your questions. Please feel free to post any questions you might have as I go through these. Next slide. Next generation, Tim, uh, traffic incident management increases safety, improves operations, and uh, provides for better situational awareness. Uh, there's more than 6 million reportable crashes that occur each year in the United States, resulting in 2 million injuries and over 30,000 fatalities. I think the latest statistics I saw from 2022 showed about uh, 41,000 fatalities in the in the states, uh, in the United States, and there's over 32 million disabled vehicles and countless incidents of roadway debris um, that we need to have uh, identification of in order to place responders and motorists at a uh, potentially risk of secondary crashes. A plan and coordinated approach to handle these incidents is the essence of TIM. And so the National TIM Responder Training Program has successfully trained more than 600,000 responders to clear incidents collaboratively, safety, safely, and quickly. 
In practice, Tim on all types of roadways have been shown to save lives, save time and money. So if we're looking at benefits, we're looking at increased safety through the safe systems approach. We're looking at improved operations and better situational awareness along our roads. And one of the things that they use for state of practice is the use of uh, drones to identify areas of uh, incidents and taking that information from camera feeds to the first responders so we can better prepare the drivers ahead of time before they come across an accident. Next slide. Okay, integrating greenhouse gas assessments and reduction targets and transportation planning is one that uh, is a very high goal of the administration. We're looking at reducing carbon footprints and looking at um, looking at ways to reduce um, that as part of the transportation sector, which is the largest, fastest growing sources of greenhouse gas emissions, CO2. The national inventory suggests the transportation sector generates approximately 29% of the nation's greenhouse gas emissions and roadway vehicles account for 83% of that amount. So integrating the consideration of greenhouse gas emissions into transportation planning, project development, and construction, as well as decision-making is a critical step that we think we can take forward in meeting national goals and reducing our climate impact. Um, so we're looking at, next slide, benefits of uh, integrating greenhouse gas uh, emissions include adaptable strategies, uh, using best practices, uh, practical mitigation, using comprehensive methods of addressing greenhouse gas emissions from tailpipe and life cycle emissions, measurable progress by looking at greenhouse gas emissions as part of the uh, performance measure, performance-based planning and programming. We can look at ways that we can align greenhouse gas reduction goals at the local level at the MPO level that is broader as a statewide level. And there's several uh, case examples and studies that we've done. Uh, state of practice is shown in the fact sheet that was provided earlier to you. Next slide. Okay, the next one is environmental project um, declarations or EPD. And these are just, uh, efforts to become more conscious of the environmental burdens that, and seek more sustainable materials and strategies that uh, would feed into transportation projects and reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions of construction materials in a transparent and standardized manner. Um, these efforts provide an opportunity to reduce negative environmental impacts by transforming the project delivery process and benefits if you Look at the benefits for EPDs. We're looking at sustainable procurement. EPDs encourage the demand supply of products that promote the more sustainable use of resources and less strain on the environment. Um, sustainable design. EPDs provide critical information for use in project level conceptual design of environmental treatments of alternative design decisions. And it provides for meaningful information on environmental performance for construction materials themselves. And also, and lastly, sustainable air asset management. EPD data can be used as input into the asset management data systems to form network level um, cost benefits and, and identify areas for environmental performance improvements. Next slide. Now, Kirk, before we move on, Edwin has a question in the chat. He says that the lack of maintenance of stripping is a safety issue. I have been working with a paver company to develop a long lasting paver that can replace striping and deliver a service life of maybe 30 years. Are you aware of any work related to this in government or higher education research studies? I know that in other countries like Australia, they're looking at uh, pavement delineation in terms of uh, uh, the ones that will glow in the dark. Uh, they're very innovative out there. They're they're showing that you know it highlights the curves better, uh, straightaways and passing zones. But um, there's also a lot of effort going underway at the TTI, looking at delineation, looking at what better pavement. Uh, 
uh, materials are out there for for uh, reflect retro reflectivity purposes. So I know there's a lot of studies that we funded under the SPR subpart B program that would be aligned to that uh, effort. But uh, does anybody else have any ideas of what we've done in terms of uh, long last lasting stripes and, and payment delineation? I think we can get back to you on that. I think, um, Shelly, if you could get his information and maybe we can come back to him with uh, some more sure. information about that. Yeah, we can do that. Okay, thanks, Johnny. Um, so the next one is enhancing performance um, with internally cured concrete. And uh, that's called EPIC. And EPIC is about uh, looking at materials uh, to reduce shrinkage cracking in concrete and looking at how to uh, make the concrete stronger and embedding reinforcement exposed to um, deterioration by the elements, reducing the service life, which would reduce the service life of the structure. Um, unlike uh, conventional curing where water is applied to the concrete surface, internal curing provides an internal source of moisture from inside the mix, improving its resistance to cracking and overall durability. And it provides an improved infrastructure that lasts longer. Um, applications that's usually used for concrete bridge decks where reduction in shrinkage coupler, coupled with lower permeability mixture designs can provide substantially improved protection to the steel reinforcements. Um, in pavement and overlays, the technology reduces the magnitude of crack widths and curling deformations that can be used for, to extend the spacing between the engineered joints. For patching and repair materials, internal curing minimizes the potential for restrained shrinkage cracking associated with high cement content mixtures designed to develop strength rapidly. So if you look at the benefits of this product, uh, versatility, durability, cost savings, and it also um, embodies uh, carbon reduction because internally cured concrete mixtures can be designed with lower water to cement ratios and uh, increase utilization of natural waste or alternative recycled cement products without reducing performance or increased risk of cracking, thus um, embodying uh, carbon CO2 reductions. So there's a state of practice that's mentioned in the fact sheets, bridge decks, pavements, and pavement patches across the country where this has been successfully used. Next slide. Okay, rethinking DBE for disadvantaged business enterprises for design build and strategic workforce development are a couple of the uh, innovations that we need to think about as part of ED7 for consideration for implementation in our state. Uh, DBE, rethinking DBE, next slide. Rethinking DBE for design build provides opportunities for small and disadvantaged firms, businesses to um, pursue the DBE program. Uh, however, states and project sponsors, because of the increased use of design build for project development, uh, this contracting method of DBE is presenting challenges to ensure that equitable opportunities are realized. Innovative tools and practices are available for modifying traditional DBE commitments to align with the design build process and improve participation. So it's looking at design build type projects for major bridges, reconstruction, uh, complex highway and, and uh, structure projects. Uh, the benefits are shown here as enhanced opportunities for uh, DBE, disadvantaged business enterprises to participate providing a wider variety of work types throughout the life of the project. Uh, flexibility in terms of design build teams are gonna have more options to plan and execute DBE participation throughout the project. Reduced risk, um, open-ended performance plans can provide better levels of uncertainty, certainty and mitigate risk for state design build teams and DBEs. So in terms of the last one, last and not least, uh, efficiency increases participation, uh, reducing the need for resource intensive good faith effort reviews 
and other associated administrative actions. So it provides a level playing field for those disadvantaged business enterprises uh, and entities to get into the market. Next slide. The last one that we're going to talk about, the seventh and the last one, is strategic workforce development. And it's talking about the demand for highway construction, maintenance, and operation workers is growing while there's a lack of, uh, of workers that are coming out of industry uh, to pursue these revolutionary emerging technologies that require new skills uh, to attract and retain workers in the contractor's workforce. New resources are available to help state, local, and tribal communities compete with other industries and demonstrate the value of a career in transportation. That includes increasing the highway construction workforce that can help communities thrive while solving one of the day's, today's most persistent national transportation problems. And it offers an opportunity to recruit underrepresented groups, including minorities and women, to jobs that can change their lives. The benefits of this type of uh, innovation include effective solutions, proven training, and customizable outreach. So there are case studies, pilots, and other resources going on in our state and other states that are helping identify potential workers to enter the highway construction uh, profession and make it a career. So there's proven training programs, um, through LTAP and other programs. There's customizable outreach through strategic workforce toolkit materials that we have and outreach events that we can use to boost efforts to place and retain workers in highway construction careers. So in the fact sheet, there's also uh, a mention of Texas's, the state of Connect, state of Texas has developed Connect YouTube Jobs program and it's and it's uh, mentioned as a, a best practice for those 18 and 24 uh, for careers in the heavy highway construction industry. Um, there's been a couple in the pilot so far, there's been several graduations and every cohort participant graduating from the uh, National Center for Construction Education and Research have been offered positions upon graduation. And there's other examples from Arizona and Idaho that are in your fact sheets. So it's a way to put, uh, put people to work, uh, improve our economy, identify careers for a future way forwards for, for minorities and women to serve in the construction industry. Next slide. So how the EDC summit works. Um, today, we're doing a virtual summit course and we're looking at ways to learn about selected innovations, which we've done. We're gonna share best practices. We're gonna provide feedback on implementation strategies and resource needs, and just open up the discussion on which innovations meet the need of each state, including our state of Texas. Next slide. As you know, in February of this year, we put together an EDC7 virtual summit and all of the seven innovations were announced, released, and showcased through presentations and uh, talked to the expert booths. Subject matter experts were on at the booths to talk about each individual innovation through uh, an opportunity to network and, and uh, provide feedback to, to states and locals, uh, public agencies on how these innovations are supposed to work in the field. So that, that innovate virtual summit was taped and there's a navigation video link on this website. So if you go to that website, you'll be able to see what they saw back in February because it was all recorded. Next slide. And one of the great opportunities in this showcase, this, this virtual showcase of EDC7, we're, we're looking at uh, homegrown innovations from state and local participants, uh, going from asset management to civil rights and workforce development. These are our design to fall into this care categories of planning environments, safe, safety operations, technology materials. So there's live presentations that were recorded 
that could be of use to each state if you desire to go back and, and look what happened at the STIC, uh, I mean EDC 7 virtual summit. Next slide. This is the exhibit hall that we had um, for each of the seven innovations that I just went through. And uh, there were live events and also um, experts at the booth to talk about, talk up their innovation to the participants virtually. Next slide. So the state-based caucus discussions that we're doing today are supposed to be virtual um, or in person. Um, they're scheduled based on your availability. And we, we set up this time for us to talk about which innovations will go forward in the next two years within our state in which we want to pursue, provide resources for, and perhaps develop task force teams to kind of implement these at uh, uh, institutionalize those at our statewide level. Next slide. So these are the uh, baseline reports that we do for each of the states. It shows what level, maturity level that uh, you begin with. And hopefully you begin with a maturity level of like development at the bottom and you move up to institutionalized would be the best case scenario. But we have a lot of areas that go from development to assessment. And uh, the baseline uh, commitments were, were already drawn in January 2019. And the goals of December 2020, one year later, show how much maturity, how much, uh, how much the sticks have used resources to pursue those to raise the maturity level of these innovations. And these were the previous EDC6 innovations. Next slide. These are resources that we can use to look at the status of everyday accounts and uh, where we are in terms of innovation across the country. We can take forward our best practices and get them published in these innovator newsletters and let other states know what's good, what good work we're doing in the state. So there's periodic progress reports that we do, everyday accounts newsletters, the innovator bi-monthly e-publication, and they also uh, the accelerating office of accelerating innovation is also looking at videos uh, to showcase best practices from around the nation. Next slide. So these are the funding opportunities that we have. We have that incentive funding for stick for up to $100,000 for each stick each year. We have a maximum of $1 million also under the aid program to incentive incentivize innovations um, on a project. And we also can increase the federal share for innovative project delivery up to 5% for projects using innovative project development uh, delivery methods. And so there's different opportunities here to, to fund and implement those innovations that we decide to go forward with. Next slide. So to keep informed, there's a newsletter that you can sign up for. A lot of you know about these and I won't go into any detail, but if you go to that website, you can sign up and be part of that uh, innovation newsletter process that we spoke about earlier. Next slide. And I'm um, handing it back off to Shelly. Shelly, you're gonna round out the survey and discussion. Uh, thank yes, you sir, thank you, Kirk. <laughs> really right, appreciate you going through those. And um, everyone well, give me a, a round of applause. No, we don't really have that, but you can go in there and do a reaction and you can do a clap. Thank you so much, Kirk, <laughs> appreciate that. Thumbs up. Um, and so I know that we have a question already um, on, it was from Nen. Did you want to speak up, Nen? You're, you're free yeah, to meet. Sure. Thank you, Shelly. Hey, Kirk, I just wanted to add one thing to what you mentioned about the, um, the roadway lighting, especially for pedestrian safety. You mentioned intersections. I would also add that uh, mid-block crossings are pretty critical because we have seen in the data that, you know, about three quarters of them are occurring away from the intersections, uh, especially for the fatals and severe injury ones. Uh, so I would add that. And plus, that's where your higher speeds typically occur, operating speeds. So it's probably right. uh, more critical in those cases. Um, my question really is about, uh, is there any good inventory of roadway lighting that you know of? Or is there one that's being 
is it even possible to to start building one if there isn't and is there any minimum in terms of like photo you know photometric minimum for good roadway lighting for particularly for pedestrians um at these locations in, in terms of any crossings what is the minimum that should be out there because um, i'm i'm thinking that i haven't heard of it or seen any good inventory and there's really i just don't know if there's a an efficient way to do that um you know i think yeah. we we we're starting to get a pretty good handle on where they are in terms of roadway lighting then we need to determine somehow if they're you know actually on or not um, we can get some of that right now through some of the cab data that we have but in terms of just the quality of the lighting itself is there an efficient way that you know of and, and we would be very interested in trying to um, trying to see if we can get to that well, I guess there's two questions there one is whether or not there's an inventory out there and the other question was whether or not there's a standard for the LED or other lighting uh, that would uh, could be documented uh, the first question about the inventory I'm not aware of any inventory of uh, lighting other than you know project level specific lighting plans for you know, like a ps &E, where you have a design of a freeway and you put in the lighting system and you specify the lighting type and uh, LED or other. Um, so there is no national database or a local, even a local database that would include lighting that I know about. And it would be a good idea to do that. I think maybe using a GIS framework or some other visual uh, product that would layer those lighting onto the system itself and to show gaps of where the lighting is poor where the state could go back and uh, reconfigure the lighting. And as far as lighting standards, I believe the MUTCD is the only source that I know of that would have um, standards associated with it, with the design of those features, those elements. Uh, the Manual Uniform Traffic Control Device is a green book. And I think it's gone through seven or eight different um, AASHTO guidance updates. Um, I'm not sure what the latest version is, but I think you can find it online pretty easily. Does that help answer your question? Yeah, yeah, it does. And going back to the inventory, I just have an, I, this idea in my head that, you know, a lot of us have come to use um, Google Street View a lot in a lot of the different applications that we do. Mm -hmm. um, wouldn't it be great if that existed for nighttime as well as daytime, right? Oh, yeah. Right, right now it exists for daytime. Obviously, th that that need is obvious. But for our purposes, in terms of not only research planning and even really engineering to some degree, if that same type of um, resource was available for nighttime, uh, you know, views, that would be really good. So we would be interested in using or developing uh, some kind of inventory if, if that existed uh, based off of that. And um, so maybe there's an opportunity there to to maybe partner with Google or someone alike. Uh, to start that and also to maybe tie it in, you know, some connected automated vehicle data that we can get from the OEMs just to uh, supplement that, that, you know, the presence of that roadway lighting itself and whether or not it's on, not to the, the quality in terms of the photometrics, but just in terms of the presence uh, of, of whether think, it's there. That's an excellent research proposal. Um, I don't know if it's a state of practice, like literature review or uh, trying to find out what's already been done in that area, but uh, you know, talk to talk to RTI and maybe look into uh, uh, working with the university to put in a proposal that would do that type of work would be my offering or suggestion. But Shelly, do you have any other ideas? Uh, uh, yeah, I was going to say, um, honestly, Min and I go way back to my Dallas days. And back when I was in Dallas, I had the opportunity to work on a pedestrian related project with Min. And one of the things we did uh, learn was related to um, the incidents occurring, occurring at night. And so, you know, nighttime visibility is very important. And I agree with those ideas, Min. And I don't know about research because I can't really tell you what to do, but I would I would say a problem statement might be good if that is a need that we have and you know TxDOT agrees. And obviously we need to find that support within TxDOT too to ensure that's something we want to do. And I don't see why not. It's a it's a great um it's a great initiative. 
We are always looking for ways to reduce a roadway deaths so that we can eventually attain zero. And, you know, uh, Austin has the Vision Zero program. There's, we could probably do some collaborative efforts as we have in the past and figure something out. Awesome. Oh, and uh, Ray had a comment also. Um, I think it was a suggestion about how to move forward with this nighttime visibility. Ray, did you want to speak up or do you want me to just read that? Can you see the comment, Kirk? It says, um, I'll go ahead and ask. Oh, okay, go uh, ahead. The comment I have, Kirk, is I see overtones of uh, STEP, safe transportation for every pedestrian. It came out of the EDC four and five, I believe. And then also with the uh, Ford focus on reducing rural roadway uh, departures. And we continue to, to promote those particular innovations at the LTAP Center uh, right now in Texas and have done presentations on them at Tessera and some other conferences as, as well. Are they looking to update that information possibly uh, into STEP and Ford? Or are these, is the nighttime visibility going to be standalone or do you see a merging of the two? Down the road. I think they're all related, Ray. Um, the problem is a lot of these were, were in previous uh, rounds of everyday counts, and uh, we we don't see a problem with you you know with these types of activities going forward. We're still working on everyday counts round one, you know, in Pell, trying to pursue Pell in our state. So every one of these kind of overlaps or integrates into the other. The next step. But the nighttime visibility is closely associated with STEP and um, it's also closely associated with the Ford, uh, the Rural Roadway Departure Program or project innovation that was in the previous rounds. Um, it's just uh, just another tool in the toolkit type thing where we go going in, we're trying to find other innovations that can help resolve the pedestrian and and bicycle fatality problem that we have in our state, in our, and even in our local, in our city of Austin, we have a number of the ghost bikes that are in, around uh, the city, and we're trying to resolve it to the point that we don't have to see those ever again, because every, any loss of life is is too much of a burden on society, because uh, one one person is just too many. So, hopefully, that kind of answers your question. That's just an evolution of of these different uh, rounds into the next round, but uh, we're still looking backwards too, as well as forwards. So if you want to talk about it more, just give me a call. Okay, will do. Thank you, sir. Yeah, because lot, there's a lot of interest out there still in those two programs in the LTAP side for the counties. Yeah, I'm sure. Are there any more comments on nighttime visibility for safety? I think that honestly, that's the one that rises to the top for me every time because of interactions that you know we have on a daily basis. If we happen to be out just after the sun goes down and somebody's running across the street and they didn't realize there was zero lighting in that intersection, you maybe didn't see them um, as they made an unsafe crossing. So things like that can happen. Um, and okay. another, go, go ahead. ahead. Oh, I was there just was gonna. Go ahead. <laughs> no, you go. There was a what? <laughs> uh, there's a there's a fatality that occurred in, in San Marcos, unfortunately. A, a woman was dropping off her kid early in the morning. I guess it was still kind of uh, light out. And uh, the kid went around the top of sort of the front of her SUV and bent over to pick something up. And the mother didn't know that the kid was still there. And that's what caused a, a recent fatality. But I don't know if that was because of the, the lighting situation or just because of the uh, uh, line of sight because the woman couldn't see under her over her SUV hood to see the child below and so that that kind of kills me when I hear about those because it's just uh, uh, a loss of life that never should have happened. Oh yeah that one actually had a big impact on us. Um, I gave my kids quite a lecture and um, I didn't know all the details. You gave me some details I wasn't aware of but it is a scary time because people are in a hurry to drop off it might be dark still, there can be lighting issues. So that is something to actually look at maybe. It's lighting yeah. around schools. Um, maybe somebody else would have seen the child or maybe if there were enough people out, somebody could have called attention. Uh, maybe that's where a crossing guard should have been. There's a lot of different things that you could look at for that. And of course we've thought about it. My, my 11 year old 
And I watch my six-year-old very closely because we want to make sure he understands as well how dangerous just being around cars is when you're a child and right. bending over. I mean, maybe he was a taller child and didn't realize that bending over means you are you are invisible. So right. it's very unfortunate or that child may not know that. So anyway, there's a lot of things that we, we could work on this together. It's a project. Yeah. That, you know. that would be a really good one. Um, and, and related. Um, so then the next one I was going to talk about was Next Gen Tim. Y'all might be familiar with the projects we've been doing in this area related to the stick. And I don't know if we have anybody here to talk about it today, but the last I heard on that, we were working towards an MOU with the 911 centers to enable um, collaboration between the two. And we're working with IT to try to find a solution to allow us to um, not be so strict because when we're working with these I mean, we're asking them for something, right? And, and then we've put a whole bunch of demands on them. And when they saw it, they're like, oh, no, 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 we don't want to do this, you know? So we're trying to find a way to work that out. And I know we've come a long way with that. I just, I don't seem to be on right now to give an update on that, but we will get one at the next stick meeting. And then GHG, uh, Kirk, a question I have for you. Um, do you see that tying in pretty well to resilience, um, which exactly. I know is not a topic on here well, also but. also not only resilience but also the carbon reduction program that we have funded under the the bill in, in the bipartisan infrastructure law um we have a carbon reduction program we get hundreds of thousands of dollars or millions of dollars um, of funding in the state of texas to to look at ways to reduce carbon emissions and that's ties closely into this uh uh, looking at greenhouse gas as part of the transportation planning process. As soon as we can get these things programmed, as we should, you know, we'll have access to those funds and we'll be actually taking an action to uh, uh, to reduce carbon emissions and get down to the, the neutral carbon levels that we need to for transportation. Uh, the other thing we're doing is resiliency improvement plans as part of the PROTECT program. And those resiliency improvement plans are going to help us by listing out projects that have true ties to extreme weather events. And those were caused primarily through greenhouse gas and climate change issues. Um, so those, those types of projects reduce CO2 emissions as well. And there's gonna be a list of projects statewide and also by region as the MPOs develop their own uh, resiliency improvement plans, RIPs we call them. But uh, the state is AECOM on, on staff, on contract to, to do this work over the next year. By 2024, we should have a residency improvement plan for the state. And for the locals, there are work going on with TTI and MPOs like the Permian Basin and uh, Beaumont and um, I believe Laredo or Hidalgo, um, Rio Grande Valley is working on something too that would look into developing their own grips. So these, these types of projects will also work coincide and collaboratively and help integrate greenhouse gas emissions and reductions planning into the transportation process at the state and local level. Okay, and then do you see that resilience or resiliency might come into play in EDC in the future? Or do you think it'll be like this where we're doing things that contribute to that without directly hitting on resiliency? Uh, it depends on who gets elected. Oh, <laughs> well, I, I think that's pretty big for everybody all across the board. Yeah, the administration, I mean, if the administration changes, the direction changes. And so we'll get a different sort, a uh, different look at uh, innovation that would be uh, found favorable by the administration. So the shifting tides, we, we can't predict, but... Uh, things can change rapidly, as you know, in the next two years. Right, right. And that's true. And hopefully it won't be too much of our road, road system based on the <laughs> resiliency, but we'll see. And I know that a lot of things that we're doing already and with the plans that you spoke of, that's becoming inherent anyway, and we're starting to move that direction, especially in Texas and at TxDOT. So um, there's a couple other there uh, topics there, the EPIC and then the EPDs and I don't know if anybody wants to speak to, to those specifically. I don't see any of the um, people I would expect to speak up on that right now, but if anyone else has anything they wanna say or ask about those two 
We did have one question earlier that we'll be following up on. But if you want to speak up now, this is um, a great opportunity. I mean, we have Kirk and he can <laughs> give us some insight. We have some people that might be able to speak to it here. And then if not, we'll go to DBE. Does any, anyone have any thoughts on any of those three EPIC, two EPDs, or DBE? A lot of acronyms there. <laughs> So DBE, the reason why I, I thought that one might play into some of our local government um, interests or working with local governments, because it is something that, um, you know, we, we have to do there. And so I don't know how, what kind of experience level we have at TxDOT with DBE other than those types of agreements, but does anyone um, have any insight from either perspective, either being, either being a DBE or working with DBEs and whether this might help or be helpful. I'm gonna call on somebody. No, I'm not gonna call on anybody. If you have anything, feel free to speak up. And if not, we'll go on to strategic workforce development, which is another top priority across the state. Hey, Shelley, I know I think, uh, oh. Megan Derry from the Federal Highway a Texas Division Civil Rights Specialist. I just wanted to mention for DBE that TxDOT is actually one of the states that's been highlighted by EDC7 and is one of the states that we're pushing other states to follow the example. Um, so DBE is something that TxDOT is very familiar with and, um, you know, is, is prepared to offer guidance and, and resources on. I think Michael Bryant might be on the call, not to put him on the spot, but if he is, <laughs> if Michael, if you have anything to add, since you've been heavily involved with the national EDC7 uh, work team on this. Like not to be put on the spot, but you're on the spot. No. Um, so do you know which um, areas of text dot might, because like, how much would, um, I mean, I know in districts, back when I was in Dallas district, there were a couple of people that would be familiar with this and understand it, but I wouldn't say it was a common knowledge. Um, so you do kind of have to have experience with it and expertise. So I don't know that it's common across TxDOT, but I know how important it is for TxDOT. Does that make sense? <laughs> so thank you for pointing that out. Um, but Michael, you're welcome to speak up or add anything if you want. Um, and then strategic workforce development would be our next one. I, right now, there's a lot going on in that area, and we do have some of our experts on that topic here. And Ray did make a comment saying he would like to say something. Um, Ray, do you want to go ahead and say that now? Sure. Uh, I had the privilege of being uh, one of the uh, development members uh, of the EDC-6 uh, strategic workforce uh, development team. And have been able to bring a lot of those things back home to Texas, so to speak. Uh, being involved with the LTAP program, uh, I'm not so much operating at the state level uh, for the AGC, you know, for the contractor workforce, but rather for the cities and counties uh, at that level. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we did kick off a, uh, a program at the VG Young Conference down in Bryan uh, about how to attract and retain uh, public works employees. And it was extremely well received. Uh, I've already got a queue of about a dozen counties and cities that have said, come visit, we need help. And I can see a partnership actually of that program uh, that we have going uh, to work with Federal Highway, work with AGC, work with TxDOT, so that we're not operating in silos on that program, but that we're covering A to Z because we're all competing for the same pot, uh, so to speak, of employees. You know, textiles trying to hire them, federal highways trying to hire them, contractors trying to hire them, cities are trying to hire them, et cetera, et cetera. And I think if we do some collaboration as, as we move forward uh, with the stick project that's handling that, and also from the EDC7, I think we can see good things come out of it. So that, that was my comment on it. Well, thank you for adding that. Um, that's really helpful. Um, and, and not everyone here knows all the activities you guys are doing. And it's, it's so good that y'all are keeping up with that and pushing it forward. Um, and we do have um, some ongoing efforts and getting that phase two out there um, for the road and bridge uh, workers. And then I noticed, do we have anyone else on the TxDOT side? Um, maybe Chris, do you have anything you wanted to say about TxDOT and kind of what we've been doing with strategic workforce? 
I mean, general or specific? Yeah, I'll uh, I'll just offer that uh, I, I know you and I have talked, Shelley, and I've uh, talked to a couple of people on uh, on this call here, and I know this is an open forum, so I'll keep my comments rather general here, but uh, especially to Megan and Kirk, I know we've been starting to trade some emails back and forth. I think our biggest revelation from the EDC7 summit was coming to us from the uh, the workforce development section of uh, a big uh, FHWA and Clark Martin's group, and really the expansion of the IIJA funding to include uh, internal workforce development for state transportation agencies. So that, uh, I think, December 5th announcement or December 12th the announcement, the revision to the IIJA, that was new language for us. And so that's something that we've started discussing internally in TxDOT about how to take advantage of those uh, IIJA funding, the 504E funding, specifically for TxDOT personnel and prospective TxDOT personnel to see if we can work closer with the Civil Rights Division to expand our workforce development efforts, both in supporting their externally focused programs and our internally focused programs. So um, definitely Megan and Kirk, be on the lookout for some more communications from text out of the next couple of weeks regarding an expansion or an expanded request of that funding. Um, uh, and I think that was the biggest development for us. It was great to see the readouts from those programs. And uh, I'll go ahead and stick my foot in my mouth and speak on behalf of civil rights they're interested in continuing their programs and tra transitioning them from pilots and projects to full-blown programs so we can really focus on this long-term workforce development pipeline. So that's what I'll add there, Shelley. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Um, and I know that there are some other initiatives like the county and city level civil rights has been involved in that you all might be aware of, uh, connect you to jobs. And things like that that are out there. But I would say as a whole, uh, strategic workforce development seems to be a big concern for a lot of people. And uh, you might've noticed a lot of changes with those things over the last couple of years for good reason. So it's good that it's still on topic. Um, and then if there's anyone else who wanted to speak up about that, um, that's good. I did have one question. Let's see if there's anything in the chat. Um, so a question for you, Kirk. Um, recently, I learned that they might be looking for more tribal involvement on the strategic workforce development for this round. And so with that, I was just curious, um, does anybody here on the call um, have contact with tribes? A lot of that's out of Oklahoma, so I wasn't sure if there was any um, thoughts on that right away, like part as far our, as if anybody knows of that. Shelly, as part of our outreach on NEVI, the National Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Program, we did make contact with three tribes in Texas. They're based in Texas. And they have uh, reservations, I wish I could remember yes. all their names, but uh, we have contact people with all three. So if, as these uh, uh, potential opportunities come up, we'll make sure that they're kept in the loop. Okay, great. Yeah, if anybody has any contacts on that, like if you guys have contacts, I mean, I know the list. I have some historic side contacts, archaeologic side. Yeah, Scott, but Scott that over text.env has got the keeper of the, the coordination list. of. Uh, yeah, and I actually Navy. spoke with them yesterday just because I was curious if we had anybody, but most of the knowledge comes out of Oklahoma on that yeah. because their offices, even though they have reservations in Texas, their offices are in Oklahoma. So it's yeah. just kind of an interesting situation, but I think it'd be great if we could either support or help or collaborate in some way through our TTAB, LTAB um, yeah. kind of world. We do have one person named uh, Barbara Maley in our office. And she's <laughs> our, Barbara is our lead uh, travel coordinator. So I knew her be, for air quality. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Barbara's good with air quality too, but um she, and uh, and Shelly, uh, just one thing on that, while we are emphasizing tribes because they were kind of looked over in EDC-6, the goal for EDC-7 on the national side is still focusing on that workforce development, getting training programs established and helping states uh, institutionalize statewide and really help the contractor. So I don't want anyone to hear the, the tribal emphasis and think, you know, this isn't something that applies to us. It's still something that very much can be taken on by a lot of locals and TxDOT as well and continue on. So. 
That helps a lot. I was, I myself was wondering if <laughs> it was going to be applicable to all the things. I, I owe you an stuff. email. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Oh, that's great. Okay. Wonderful. Okay. And then, so now we can move on to the, I think we can move on, it, but if anybody has any questions, you still can ask. Um, we're not stopping that, but we will be doing a poll the audience so that everybody can get an opportunity to just rank these as to importance for you and your organizations. And please, everyone on the call, feel free to do this. Um, Charnette Lucas, our very own Charnette, UTA LTAP, <laughs> is going to go over this for you guys. Good morning. Um, so today we will be using the Menti meter for our online interactive survey. So we have a couple of options for you guys to um, access the online tool. So the first option is you can scan the QR code with your smartphone. The second option is you can type in, I mean, you can go to www.menti.com. And you can type in the code there. And then the second one is we are going to provide a link for you guys to um, use the link that's going to be provided in the chat. So if you go to menti.com, you can type in 22649142. And I'll give you guys a few minutes to do that. Um, if you need any technical assistance with accessing the survey, please let us know by using the chat. And now I'm gonna go ahead and switch over to the survey. Okay, so, so far, looks like Next Generation Tim is in first place. Nighttime visibility for safety second. Enhancing performance with internal cured concrete third. And fourth, a strategic workforce development. Okay, so we still have a few more, I think. Yeah, people. we have. Yeah. It. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so far, we've only had a few people. So if you need any uh, technical assistance with accessing the survey, let us know through the chat. Looks like they're coming in now. And just so y'all know, this is more for like visual purposes and just to get a um, preliminary, I can't talk, preliminary ranking from, from the core members like the stick members that are here and the people that have come to represent. We just want to know um, all of your thoughts. You're all welcome to participate. Like I said, we do want to hear from you.
And I think, uh, Charnette, will it continue to record like if people enter after we? Yes, it will uh, continue. Okay, yeah. Good, good, good. So we'll still have and, that if y'all are able yes. to fill that in sometime. And the link, it, again, is in the chat as well. So two years ago when we did this, we did a ranking, we used a different program, but um, visually it was helpful for everybody to kind of see what everyone else was thinking and at least in the discussion that we're having um, with the people here. And so that's just helpful. And it is just a sample um, since we all just represent either a field or an area or you know, some of us are here from universities, TxDOT externally. So all of that is relevant. It's kind of like betting on horses to see who wins. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, if one falls to two, I don't think it's the end of the world, but I, I do think it is helpful for us to just know where to focus, you know, our topics. And then also to do more outreach. And that's another thing we will do after this. Um, LTAP and I will work together to do some outreach. And of course, some other wonderful people at STEC I'm sorry, text dot that can help. Um, I was going to call them out accidentally, but you know, all of the all of that helps. If you know somebody in a local government, or if you have a contact with somebody. Recently, I talked to Erica actually about a community college that was doing something um, really, really good related to strategic workforce development, and so, and I've already had some interest in that information from NCT Cog. So, you know, I think just sometimes hearing about it, learning, sharing the information, you're already facilitating the growth of that um, innovation, so. Okay, and then if y'all want, we can go ahead and go on to the next slide so people don't feel like we're just pressuring them to do <laughs> um, Like, okay, we only have 15, no, um, but you know, of the people here, I think it is representative of the different groups, yes. so we can move on to the next slide. Okay, sorry, I was having trouble turning on my camera here. <laughs> okay, and so, you know, we've had some discussion throughout and I think it was healthy discussion, but feel free that if something popped in your mind, you're welcome to bring it up now. You can also email um, me or Charnette and we'll get that information channeled appropriately. Charnette, do you wanna post your email? And several people already know my email but I'm going to put it here anyway. Um, so I think we've accomplished what we came here to do. We've got some rankings some priorities. We can see where the interest lies. And again, this year, strategic workforce development is rising to the top. So, and, and for good reason, we want to make sure we have the right people in the right jobs. That does go a long way into having a continuous and safe roadway system throughout the state. So we will be making contacts as we need to with locals. And that includes um, MPOs, we'll reach out to MPOs. We also might be talking to the TIA group because there are a lot of city members that have expressed interest in EDC. And I think that having maybe a follow-up conversation with them might be good. So for some of y'all that are here representing that group, um, feel free to speak up. If you think that's a good idea or you think we can coordinate something like that. Um, I know we have um, Lauren, I think you're here. Eric is here. So I don't know if y'all wanted to talk about that, but we can always follow up later and have those additional conversations. But for now, we will be sending out the presentation. We'll be sending out the links um, to the Zoom. Hey, so Sean, you can I think had a question. Go ahead. Yeah. Kevin had a question. Oh, I don't, didn't see that. Go ahead, Kevin. Uh, thanks, thanks, Shelley, and and Kirk. And, and it's, it's more of a comment than a, than a question. I just want to uh, reiterate what you guys were saying. And for those on the call who have uh, selected uh, those various EDCs as something that either they're doing or would like to do, that there is federal assistance out there 
to uh, to assist you if needed. So, you know, if, if there's something that you don't understand about that particular EDC, then there are federal teams out there that can uh, that can actually meet with you or actually, Kirk, I don't know if they're still traveling for, for that effort, but are able to come in and help help those teams out uh, achieve those EDC levels that we want them to achieve, right? Absolutely. I mean, we have subject matter expert teams for each of the innovations that we mentioned today, the seven, and they're willing to come out and do workshops, peer exchanges, whatever needs to be done to kind of uh, advance the technology, advance the innovation in your neck of the woods. Right. And if you look in your invitation for today through Outlook, you can see that we did add the fact sheets and those are really helpful. I think at the end of those fact sheets, sheets there are contacts. FHWA expert contacts for each innovation. Is that correct? Yes, there is. Oh, thank you, man. <laughs> yeah, I was looking um, at the fact sheets that I have, and they, yes, they do include them. Yeah, I think it's on the on the back or at the very end. Yes. Okay, and so um, I don't know. Did we want? Did we have anybody from other groups, uh, mobility authorities, or any? that wanted to speak up about something that stuck out to you, like, or if anybody at TechStot just wants to say, you know, something you think is important to share about EDC. Um, I appreciate everyone who's spoken up to now, and I appreciate all of you being here, but feel free to jump in. We want to hear from you. And these are closing thoughts as well, if you want to throw anything else in there. I think we had um, several STIC members here today. It doesn't look like we have NCT COG, but we'll definitely make sure everybody who wasn't able to make it today for conflicts and other things going out on throughout the state, like in Houston, related to some of these topics. Um, so thank you all. And I think we're okay to adjourn unless anybody has anything else. Raise your hand, speak up. I'll give you a minute. Thank you all I for being to thank, here. I just wanted oh, to thank everybody. Ahead. Thank everyone for their participation today. It's an important uh, part of our uh, EDC deployment efforts and we is a must have. So appreciate your uh, time and attendance today and Shelly, all your work, your hard work in putting this thing together and also showing at UTA. Thank you. Thank you, Kirk. We appreciate you being here as well. All right, everyone. Well, thanks again. And if you need anything, just reach out. We're here for you. Oh, claps. Thank you. <laughs>